good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. And thank you for being here today to hear about our work in Pakistan. We have friends uh, from multiple continents joining us today, so welcome to all. Uh, we had a couple of questions in the chat um, about the music. So the beautiful music that you're listening to today is from Pakistan. It's by an amazing collective of women um, that we wanted to share with you today as we celebrate the incredible women around the world during Women's History Month here in the US. Uh, details about the song are in the chat. So I've had a great opportunity to meet many of you, but for those that I haven't, my name is Jeremy Haldeman, and I'm the Director of Government Affairs and Advocacy at Alight. I like to describe my job as connecting doers, thinkers, legislators, and policymakers with our amazing staff, volunteers, and customers around the world. So a couple of housekeeping things for today. The first thing we would like to do is, since we're living in a virtual universe right now, is to invite everyone to turn on their video if you can and jump off of mute and just say hello. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Oh, hello, everybody. Hi. 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 Hello. Hello. Howdy. Good morning, are you? Love seeing and hearing so many people. So, thank you. so now that we came off of mute, we're going to ask you to go back onto mute so that we can hear our speakers today. Uh, a couple other housekeeping items. There's a Q and A time at the end of our um, at the end of the event. But this is casual and interactive, uh, so feel free to put any questions into the chat. We'll hold some for the end and we'll also be answering some of them in real time in the chat. Now, for those of you who know Alight, you know that we are humanitarians. Uh, we believe that there is a simple human justice in the chance to build a life. So when we find people displaced from home, we help them with their basic needs. But that's living, that's not a life. A life is one that is filled with joy, dignity, connection, and purpose. And that's what we at Alight aim to build. And that's actually what we're gonna hear about this morning. Our WorkShare series is about giving you all an inside look at the work that we are doing to co-design new solutions with displaced and marginalized people around the world to help them build full and fulfilling lives. We've been working in Pakistan for nearly 20 years, actually since 2003. Our work began with refugees from Afghanistan in camps and communities in the Western Baluchistan province, uh, where we provided clean water, health services, and more. Since that time, we've responded to multiple emergencies in the country, including the 2005 earthquake in the Bakh district. But the Alight team is actually uh, focused on another group of people in Pakistan, and that's out of school children. As of today, 18.7 million school aged children are not attending school of any kind, and that was actually before the pandemic. Missing out on an education will follow these children as they become adults and throughout the rest of their lives. It'll affect their ability uh, to make a living, it'll affect their resilience, and much more. So Alight's Pakistan team has been working on this issue to ensure all kinds of families can get their kids access to an education. So I'm really excited to introduce two people who've been working on this and agreed to tell us about it. First is Brett Rapley. He's based in Qatar, and he works, for the he works on Educate a Child for the Education Above All Foundation. Brett has worked very closely with our team over the length of the AC's partnership with Alight, and his diverse experience in the design, management, and evaluation of development initiatives across Asia, Africa, and South America. He's guided government and non-governmental entities to plan for and manage direct and indirect aid across a variety of geopolitical contexts. Brett, thank you for joining us. And we also have Dr. Tariq Chima. Trick is the Alight's country representative in Pakistan and has been for the past eight years. He's a renowned social innovator and philanthropist. He was actually the founder of the World Congress of Muslim, Muslim Philanthropists, where his trend-setting efforts toward institutionalizing Muslim philanthropy worldwide has actually earned him international acclaim. Since his career switch from uh, surgery to philanthropy in 1997, Dr. Chima has had an unusually diverse career as a senior executive, advisor and non-executive director in both the nonprofit and corporate sectors. We at Alight are very fortunate not only have him on our team, but for him joining us today. So I'm really excited to um, actually introduce the moderator of our conversation today. She is an international multimedia journalist, Nukpat Malik, a voice for America. Nukpat is talented in the areas of filmmaking, journalism, and broadcast. 
Her work encompasses not only reporting assignments and broadcasting news, but also independent documentaries on various social and cultural issues. We were really lucky to actually be, meet Nukbai last year when she reported on the Alliance Pakistan's recent efforts to pivot our education programming during COVID-19 to deliver learning via radio, where she interviewed some young women who co-designed and helped make the program a success. So Nukbai, I'm gonna hand it over to you, but as I do, we would love to hear what struck what struck you about this program. What has given you so much energy about this and has informed your reporting? Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Jeremy, for this wonderful introduction. Um, uh, and let me say a quick and big thank you to Alight for giving me this wonderful opportunity. And it's just wonderful to see all you people uh, from different parts of the world. It's just amazing. Um, so, so yeah. So last year, when I, uh, you know, first got introduced with uh, this program and uh, this education program, which is going on in Pakistan, I was really uh, fascinated by, um, you know, the kind of uh, work and encouragement was actually given to children, uh, which normally I haven't seen like, you know, uh, people uh, like children were young children, young girls were given um, so much opportunity and so much confidence. And I remember when I spoke to all these uh, girls for this uh, report, I was just amazed to to see how their their mind is just running so fast with the with the technology with the education, you know, they're so aware. So I I think that that's uh, just amazing. Um, and uh, uh, again, thank you very much for you know giving me this opportunity of moderating today's event. Um, so I won't take much time, and I will start off uh, with this. Um, Tariq, uh, I have met you for the report last year, and it's a great opportunity to see you again today. Um, so there are some uh, warm up questions which I would like to start with, uh, and the questions are going to be uh, from from uh, Tariq and Brett. Um, I'm going to uh, start with uh, Tariq. Um, so uh, tell me, um, can you guys see me properly? Um, I hope everyone is like, I, I don't know why, but my, my computer is giving me a signal that maybe my video is jammed. So if something happens, please let me know. My production team is behind all this. So please let me know if something happens on my end. Uh, you never know technology. So, so let me start with these warmer questions. Uh, Tarek, uh, you tell me you are a physician and now primary, uh, primary education is what you're fighting for. Um, so what exactly made you so glad you are part of this work? Oh gosh, I am a physician no more. <laughs> so uh, in fact, uh, you know, about 20 years back, I decided to, uh, you know, involve more into a global healthcare landscape and uh, started working with, uh, you know, some blindness initiatives in Africa, some other uh, infectious diseases uh, work in Mexico, and then also volunteering uh, in various parts of the world uh, for medical emergency relief, including tsunami and few other earthquakes and, and things like that. Uh, so that was a humble start. And then uh, I moved into a policy advocacy space, uh, moved to Geneva and uh, tried to convince the member states to bring you know, more harsher regulations against uh, smoking. And from there on, I think I uh, kept finding opportunities to remain more into the international space. Uh, one of my past role has been the executive director for a physician association in the United States, uh, also being the CEO of a global donors forum. So uh, when I alight extended me an opportunity uh, to work in Pakistan, that was the time when alight had uh, healthcare and nutrition as its uh, mainstay uh, program. And, uh, and I thought that's the best fit. And uh, as I come to Pakistan and I started realizing that yes, we are doing a wonderful work, uh, reaching out to mother and you know, the kids about nutrition and, and the health. Uh, but the problem, the real problem, the basis is basic education. So the Pakistan's problem, uh, actually the root cause is education. That system needs to be improved. This country is not resource poor. 
but the condition of people is poor because they are unable to educate their people. So uh, I had to go back and I'm grateful uh, for a light leadership and their vision and they said, yes, we will take a chance. Let's put our best and see if we can make a real difference in education. Uh, because I'll give you an example why I said that. Let's say if I'm dealing with the children with diarrhea and the family doesn't even know about the basic hygiene or you know, you know, giving a boiled water, for instance, to their children, you are living in a cycle where you keep on treating the kids, but then there will be no preventive measures. And where does that come from? It comes from the education. So, so this was the thing. And uh, we were then very lucky uh, to have uh, education above all uh, take us as their partner. And in fact, we started our journey in education with them, which yeah. is uh, still continuing. Right, Tarek, I'm, I'm gonna speak to you in detail about this uh, shortly. Uh, my next question is to you, Brett. Thank you very much for your time and it's very nice meeting you today. Um, so will you, uh, will you tell us about Educate a Child um, and uh, the education above all and about your mission and the team working with you? Yeah, so Educate, uh, Education Above All is a, is a program or a foundation that was set up by Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Moza bin Nasser in 2012. Uh, it's made up of sort of four key programs. Uh, you have Educate a Child, Alpha Cora, uh, Reach Out to Asia and Peace. Effectively, uh, these sort of uh, programs aim to sort of uh, provide opportunity and hope to uh, vulnerable and marginalized children, uh, youth and women. Uh, we see sort of education as the sort of the primary uh, approach to make that sort of change uh, to provide these, um, these ch children in particular for us, uh, to give them sort of the um, opportunity to get out of poverty, to uh, have socioeconomic growth and mobility um, and to try and, um, you know, build peaceful societies, you know, we, we sort of, a lot of the, our beneficiaries come from uh, conflict affected areas, uh, very much similar to the beneficiaries that are light supports across the world. And the idea is, is that we see education as, as this sort of real fundamental right for children and, and youth. And that, you know, we need to be supporting that as also a key foundation for the SDGs and SDG four, but also for gender and poverty and other areas as well. You know, there's also, there's a lot of crossover when you're looking at how education can impact sustainable development goals. Uh, for Educate a Child, um, it's also been around since 2012. Uh, we've sort of supported 75 projects across 53 countries. It's a very global program. And we primarily work through partnerships. We, uh, we support our implementing partners on the ground who have the extensive experience uh, working in these regions, who know the real issues, the real barriers that, that impact um, not only um, the sort of access to education, but also, you know, what keeps kids into school, what enables them to complete primary education. Um, at this point, we've supported, um, or what we've committed to about 10.3 million uh, children, out of school children to get into primary school. Um, we work on a, a sort of a co-funding model. We're like a catalyst. Um, we'd like to support existing uh, projects and programs uh, that have already sort of shown an impact and to give those implementing partners that sort of added investment to either increase scale or the scope of their programming to get more kids into school. And, you know, and then really it's about making sure that, you know, that each one of these children sort of develop their own, their own agency and have their own, you know, long-term benefits from that education. So, you know, this has been, a, as I said, Tarek sort of alluded to, we've been a partner with them from the start um, Pakistan, as people know, has one of the, the larger sort of out of school children populations in the world. So it's been a, an absolute pleasure to be working uh, with a light in Pakistan to address this issue. Yeah. yeah, of course, speaking of partnerships, Tariq, I would like to ask you, you've been working with EAC Rep and EAC for three years now. Um, what has surprised you most about this partnership? This partnership, well, it's been extremely yeah. collaborative. Right after, you after this, yeah, I actually have the same question to you too, but I will let Tarek first to answer, please. Okay, no worries, thanks. Thank you. Uh, well, I think that uh, 
it has never ever felt that it is a monetary transaction relationship between the two entities. It has been a partnership from the day one, both in letter and spirit. And I have experience of working uh, with number of donors in past, but I think the relationship we enjoy with the EAA uh, has been phenomenal because uh, when you are a partner, you uh, are transparent to each other. So we feel equally comfortable sharing our success and failures with our I'm sorry, Tarek, we cannot hear you. And, and I think this is the relationship which directly, uh, you know, results in a better performance and progress. Because I think the support that EAA has been providing us all along in terms of their flexibility, uh, in terms of their, uh, you know, willingness to listen to us 24 seven and not just wait for a quarterly or biannually reports actually provides us sort of a navigational support all along because they have been funding this program in number of other countries and to number of other stakeholders or partners, even including in Pakistan. So I think the experience they have working with different countries, different people, and that has been a great help to us wherever we need a troubleshooting, wherever we have done something great that they would even encourage other partners to learn from us. So I think the role uh, of, uh, of EAA in this whole process has been facilitation, cross you know, teaching or, or learning. And I think this is something so unique and I hope that uh, other donors will take it as an example. Great. So Brett, now I would like uh, to ask you the same question. What has surprised you most about, you know, Tarek and working with the Allied Pakistan team? Yeah, I think what, what's impressed me the most, to be honest with you, is seeing how the approach to partnership at the country level is very much uh, similar to what we're trying to do globally as well. Tarek and his team have had this amazing ability to be able to build relationships across the, the public and private sector, the NGOs, um, various community stakeholders, working from the ground level all the way up to national. As people who understand the Pakistan context, it's very complex. You know, each different region or province has its own um, political issues and cultural issues and priorities. And what's impressed me a lot is how, how Tarek and his team have been able to navigate that. Uh, for us, it's been more of a case as the partner coming in to try and give them that flexibility to be able to maneuver the intricacies required to be able to deliver in this context at such a large scale. Like, I mean, we're talking about a million children over a three, four year period and with very, very limited resources to do that. And the, the fundamental approach to this project has been that idea on partnership and how to bring these different entities together around a common goal. And uh, it's been extremely impressive for me to watch his team uh, work around that. I have an understanding of the Pakistan context. I also worked in Afghanistan for seven and a half years I know the complexities of the region and I've been so impressed with how, how Tarek and his team has been to bring these people together to, to achieve the, the goal that they set for themselves. Great, great. Well, it's it's great and wonderful uh, meeting you two gentlemen. Um, and that was uh, just a session to warm up and because I have more questions uh, coming up for you two. Uh, but before that, I'm gonna actually uh, request my production team to play a video uh, before we uh, move further. So would you please uh, play the video now? Do you see this child? He is nine years old. He takes care of his parents at night. He scrambles to provide food for his family during the day. Most people think, what is he likely to achieve in life? But one day, the world will take notice of him. He himself doesn't know yet. These days, instead of selling eggs, he sports a broad smile and a school bag on his shoulders.
Samina too had a beautiful smile. However, it waned after a raging fire that destroyed 13 schools in the area. But this fire failed to dampen her optimism and resolve. Her school was the citadel of her dreams. Soon, she witnessed it being rebuilt. Her smile returned with the school's reopening. So did her resolve for her studies. Determination and passion to achieve big things are not confined to age. This eight-year-old boy has set his goals high. His aim is to be able to defend his country. He attends school every day, dreaming of guarding a country where children are free to flourish. It's not just children who dream and achieve greatness. Our elders have done the same. Headmistress of Bachel Patafi School, Ms. Benazir refused to go on leave or close the school when there were no students. Where there is a will, there is a way, she says. Now 110 girls attend classes every day. Every girl student of the village now dreams of becoming a teacher. Under the Educate a Child program, similar stories of over one million students abound. Each dream unique, each story exceptional. But each story is bound by a common thread. Parho Age Barho, with the promise, whoever wants to study, progress and prosper, they will always find a light showing the way. In partnership with Government of Pakistan and Education Above All. Wow, I love this video and I would like to see comments on this video in the chat from all you wonderful people. Um, uh, as a filmmaker, I just love the way it has been put together. So I can talk about this video for hours, uh, but let's just move on to, to the next part of um, uh, this uh, event. And before we move on, uh, I am going to ask uh, the audience uh, to put their questions at the uh, uh, in the chat, and we will definitely take those questions at the end of this conversation. Um, so let's just start uh, with Tariq again, and uh, now I would like to actually um, ask you, um, uh, you know, if you could tell us about the state of children and education in Pakistan today, um, and maybe you could also touch on how COVID has impacted uh, the situation for children in the country. Uh, well, Pakistan is a country of about 220 million people and 10% uh, of that population are the children between ages uh, five to 16 who are not going to schools. And I think that's uh, a very serious thing to take note of. Uh, now, uh, the governments have been doing their best, including the international uh, actors as well as local NGOs. And we do see a trend from in the past five years, moving down from 22 plus million to little under 19 million, uh, as uh, government has recently announced. Uh, but this, these numbers are before COVID. So we have yet to see the impact of COVID. But when we talk from our own perspective, we have, it has taken three years for us to bring about 900,000 children into the system. And most of the children that we uh, have been working with are coming from the uh, low to moderate socioeconomic backgrounds. And the children who do not have the luxury of uh, internet connectivity, gadgets, uh, online classes, you know, most of the compensatory, uh, you, know, uh, you know, acts have been around. So, so what we are up to is that we have been looking around what I call is the low cost affordable but high impact solutions. And one of the things that we have introduced in the aftermath of COVID was to establish uh, and then successfully broadcasted nationwide a radio school. 
So which in fact had 30 sessions, which is uh, from, you know, from grade one to five curriculum has been put into audio sessions, uh, 30 sessions that are now available as an open source, both on YouTube, but uh, federal government has taken it uh, across the country and it has been broadcasted. So our careful estimate is that this program has reached to about 2 million children across country, not only the kids that we have enrolled, but also the children who have been studying either in non-formal or formal schools, but they have been able to use it. So, so I think the impact of uh, COVID on the out of school children condition has yet to be seen. Uh, however, uh, a country with a large population and then having the world's second largest number of out of school children uh, is the place where light is uh, so very privileged to work and make a difference. And this downward trend in the number of out of school children uh, is really amazing. Yeah, and I personally think you are making a difference. Um, so, uh, Brett, moving to you, um, your organization, EAC Rev, um, has had an eye on the situation of the children missing education in Pakistan and around the world. Uh, so can you tell us about your global commitment, please? Yeah, and, and first I'd like to say that, you know, with COVID is obviously, it's been a horrific uh, international health crisis, but it's also created, I think, one of the largest educational crises that we've seen in the modern era. I think even um, UNICEF was stating upwards at one stage there were 1.6 billion children out of school. And there's been a huge amount of effort uh, from us and also from our partners um, to try and make sure that, you know, that number doesn't see um, many kids remain out of school. And this is a real big um, concern for us in the sense that there's been many uh, at-risk children, for example, who are already on the verge, struggling to get to school, that may never uh, re-engage with schooling again once schools start to reopen. And another big concern for us is also to maintain this focus on the 59 million children who were out of school before the pandemic. Uh, these children were already vulnerable, marginalized, you know, suffering from poverty and conflict um, you know, gender issues. And, um, we're, you know, for us, it's about making sure that we keep the focus on those children that have sort of suffered a double jeopardy situation, not only doing the, the normal barriers preventing them going to school, but also the resulting COVID issues and the economic uh, pressures that have been put on the families and also having local schools closed, not enabling them to access uh, education during long periods of time. For us, um, it's, as I said, it's continuing the focus on these children. It's about uh, at-risk children, making sure that we can keep them in, 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 into the system, make sure they do come back once schools reopen and, uh, and don't drop out. Uh, we have, a, obviously, we've had our 10.3 million that we've already committed to. I think we're around about close to 8.5 million of those kids have already been enrolled into school. So we're gonna keep pushing forward to, to make those commitments into realities over 10 million. Uh, we're committing another million a year on top of that at the moment to, to it's not just stopping at that sort of that initial grand target of 10 million kids. We're adding onto it each year. And I think it's also important for us to keep co-funding and leveraging uh, more financing towards education. Uh, we're working with, with different uh, banks and new partners and looking at uh, innovative financing mechanisms to try. We know that we can't do it alone in regards to getting all these kids into school. This idea of partnerships is critical. So it's about how we can sort of leverage more financing and support more innovative approaches such as such as Alliance, you know, getting more and more kids into school on their own, which is un unbelievable and, and fantastic, to be honest with you. And it's also about these kind of events. You know, I think that we have to keep this, these kind of uh, advocacy uh, initiatives going forward. Uh, I think there's a real risk that as people are sort of dislocated across the world and not able to come together, that we, we try and make sure that we have events such as this to keep the, the issue of uh, out of school children uh, at the forefront, uh, that it doesn't get lost. And that we make sure that we keep on um, promoting uh, the, the, the education of kids and the access and the opportunities that come from that. That's great. I mean, it's huge and it's wonderful, like, you know, uh, taking care of 
um, so many children. So now if you could shed some light about your specific partnership with Alight Pakistan and, and Mr. Tariq. Oh, okay, uh, sorry. Yeah, so look, I mean, uh, our, our partnership going forward is, you know, we have a project right now that, that that's already managed to get over 900,000 kids into school. Uh, we have another 150,000 to go. So uh, we're hoping that we can definitely make that target before the end of the project uh, finishes. I think that um, obviously we, we want to sort of celebrate that and, and to continue also um, seeing about future possibilities. You know, the, the light team has been an excellent partner for us. We don't want to see it end right here. Um, we are aware that there's still four to five million primary school kids out there in Pakistan that need access to education. I think we've got close target to about 20% of them. So I think we need to try and uh, target on the, the remaining 80%. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can come together and then look at a new initiative that will follow on from this. You know, we'll keep pushing on those gross enrollment ratios. I think I was looking at it today, just checking, you know, and since 2017, 18, when this project started, you know, the GER rate in Pakistan has gone from 90 to 95. You know, and I think that this uh, project, with the, the, the scale of this project, has definitely had a huge contribution to pushing that target forward. And it's also reflected in the girls as well, too. I think it's gone up from about 83 to 87. So, you know, the, the, you can see the impact there. It, it's, it's not just at, um, at a local level, it's been reflected nationally as well. So I think we need to keep pushing on those numbers and, uh, and keep going forward. Great, great. Um, so my next question is uh, from Tariq. And uh, before I move on to that question, I just wanted to remind the audience, if you have any questions, please keep them in your chat and we will definitely um, take those questions at the end of this conversation. Um, so Tariq, my question is from you now. Um, Alight operates the, uh, the largest program for out-of-school children in Pakistan and you are, uh, you've nearly reached your three-year goal of enrolling one million kids in school. Um, so, and it's, it's a huge undertaking. It's a huge, uh, you know, work you have done. I really admire it. So how has it been going? I mean, what have you learned through the process and how have you and your team had to shift and pivot? Uh, I think as, uh, as Brett has said, uh, our partnership with EAA uh, has been uh, a unique trend setting effort. So when we first start talking about out of school children, uh, the maximum program size we could think of was 100,000 children. And I remember uh, having this conversation back and forth with EA that looking at the size of the overall children in Pakistan, what could be the 10 X approach for instance, you know, what can we do in terms of really taking the risk being bold uh, and let's try to do something. And we picked up this 1 million as a unit. And I remember a lot of people had to, you know, cause doubts and, uh, you know, probably doubt in our sanity as well. Uh, but I was so uh, privileged and you know, working with Brett and Mary and all of our friends in EAA and then I'm our own team uh, at the headquarter who have put faith in our country program was that we were the first uh, actors in Pakistan who have brought the word one, I mean, the term one million, that this is going to be the unit. So that is going to be our first milestone and then we'll go for the next million and the next million. And today, uh, not only us, but our public sector partners are already talking with us in terms of millions you know, like uh, SAS program, the Benazir Income Support Program, have had a conversation, they're talking about maybe bringing 5 million more kids into the network. So I think the, the major thing that we have done was that we have set a trend that any number less than a million will make a difference, but will not put a dent in the existing situation. So that was the first thing. And uh, then of course, we have to prove ourselves. So over three years, not only that we have built a very broad-based partnership 
platform, but there were a lot of other people we could sense that they are still sitting on the sidelines, do not want to come forward and be partner because they still have to see whether we'll make it. So on the year one, we were close to 300,000 and then we moved to about 600,000. And now at the end of year three, we are across the 900,000 barrier. Of course, because of COVID, we have been delayed. We were hoping to have all, you know, a million plus kids within 2020, but now we are aiming at by the middle of 2021, uh, we will be able to meet that target. And uh, as Brett said, that would be time to celebrate, but at the same time would be uh, a next challenge. You know, which one, what is the new peak we have to reach at or the new summit? So this is a, work in progress, a uh, million is a big target, but that is not enough either. So we hope that this trend continues and we have never looked at this as a 36 month long project. We looked at it that this has been uh, with EA's uh, support, we have generated a movement and we want that movement to continue beyond these project cycle. That means not only Alive, not only EAA, but many other donors, the local, the international, the public sector, provincial governments have to put out of school children as their priority. Mm -hmm. and, and this is, I think, will determine the long-term success of this partnership. As of today, we can say, yes, we have meet a million target for a country program or the you know, a country lead uh, we can be very happy and we will be, but you know, beyond that hooray, there are millions of more children who we cannot ignore. So I think that is our target, uh, which uh, for the foreseeable future, I think we will continue making an effort as long as we have resources, as long as we have wealth. Right, Tariq, and I must say that girls are taking initiative in this program and there is a specific engagement of girls. I would want you to speak about that, but here I just want to pause you and uh, want to speak to the audience. Um, just wanted to say that we just had an anonymous donor. Um, she is telling us that she wants to challenge everyone on this call to give. And she's offering a $10,000 uh, matching challenge. Um, so uh, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, audience uh, can ask the question uh, in the chat. And also, if, the, if you want to donate, uh, you, can, you, you can write to us in the chat. Um, so uh, moving on. Uh, as I was saying, Tariq, uh, girls are, you know, the specifically engaged in this program. So I want you to tell us what is the big secret? Why, why it's such a success? Uh Yes, we, uh, we have been wondering ourselves, to be honest, you know, what is that secret? Mm -hmm. uh, because this program uh, has been phenomenal when it comes to the ratio of the girls. We have 46% of those 900,000 girls are girls, actually. The, the, from 900,000 children, 46% are females, sure. the girls. And we are in a country which has been in the news for you know having uh, uh, resistance against girls' education and things like that, or we are talking about some cultural norms that have been preventing girls from going to school. But to be honest, I have yet to come across a single parent who would say, we do not want our girls to be educated. Yeah. However, they have some hard questions to ask. Either we will shy away and do not address those and keep saying that this is the problem with the people. They do not want their girls to be in the school. But I think it is important for us to know where we as humanitarian or development sector actors, where the governments be at a, you know, a local, provincial or federal have failed. See, so there are issues, for instance, for the girls distance and safety is one big issue. The provision of uh, toilets and other, you know, hygiene uh, supplies is a big challenge as well. Uh, then people do ask a very fair question, and that is the relevance of that education. How that education is going to help their children to have a future. So if the quality of education is poor, 
if it is not relevant to your, uh, you know, the skills that you need, and it does not produce you or prepare you for your today and tomorrow, that means there is a serious issue. And that is something that we need to not only look into, uh, we, have all, we must also share our learnings with the policymakers. So we had an independent research on that. Uh, and we found out that, you know, one of the major things that we have done through our community mobilization uh, in this program has been do not go to community to identify, enroll, and teach a child. Go to the community to build the relationship with the parents. Right. And, and then tell them that you are the people who are going to take the ownership and leadership of this effort within your community. Your kids' future depend upon you. And I think when you go and it's your female literacy mobilizer, let's say talking to a mother or going to in a community where she is well known, or you are hiring teachers who are females, and then you are establishing non-formal schools within communities where they know where the girls are going. It's easy to go. And then if you're also introducing flexible hours, if girls are busy, they cannot attend a school eight o'clock in the morning because they have house chores, then can you come up with the flexible hours? Because our aim is to educate the girls. We are not bound that it has to start at 8 a.m. It can be a 10 a.m. school, it could be 1 p.m. school. So some of those interventions and innovations that we learned, we kept on scaling up in our work. And I think that is something uh, which uh, other organizations can learn from. And this has been, uh, you know, a great success when it comes to engaging more parents, engaging more community, and end result, bringing more girls to the schools. Great, great. And I think this, uh, this uh, approach is uh, very feasible and very healthy also, because it also shows how the organization respects the culture, like the diversity of culture and the norms and everything, and it, it helps you uh, grow easily, I guess. Uh, so, Brett, I would like to ask you now, are you happy with the progress that's been made in Pakistan through Alight and uh, other organizations? And what's your vision for children in Pakistan in the years ahead? Yeah, like, I mean, who, who couldn't be impressed? You know, like, it was, a, as Tarek mentioned earlier, this was an extremely ambitious target um, and a very short time frame. Uh, there were a lot of whether it could be achieved. And I think that, um, you know, what's been able to be done even at this point with the challenges of COVID over the last year is quite remarkable. And then I think that, as Tarek mentioned, I think we will make it across, across that million threshold. And I think that that in itself says a lot um, in regards to the, the quality and the capacity of this project to, as I mentioned earlier, to, to bring such a variety of partners across various provinces with different systems uh, to achieve this target. You know, I think the people, you know, quite don't even like, I mean, to give you an example of that complexity, you know, we looked at the data itself, you know, there was a lot of question marks about, you know, is, is it valid? How can you prove that, you know, a million children will actually be enrolled? And, you know, we did data quality assessments and we saw how a lot was working with the education management information systems of all the different provinces, it was how they were validating it, cleaning it, and verifying it at the ground level. Um, you know, it's quite quite amazing, really, when, when you see uh, that kind of effort in regards to uh, making sure that the fundamentals, such as you know, your M and E and your data valid validation, uh, coming through, which is extremely impressive, and our uh, M and E team at uh, EAA EAC was extremely impressed with with the setup that uh, Light had to make sure that those numbers were valid. I think for us with uh, Pakistan, um, you know, we, we have, we are supporting a couple of other projects as well, and we'll continue doing that. But I, but I think it's, um, you know, I think it's about really listening to, to Tarek and the team and seeing what they want to do next. You know, we're not, we're not a prescriptive uh, partner. Um, we, we do like to uh, listen to, to our partners in regards to what the needs are on the ground. 
um, to get an understanding from them what the barriers are and, and what are the what are the kind of strategies required in regards to targeted support uh, that will look at achieving more or getting more kids into school over the long term. Um, I think that we'll probably do a little bit of a stock take at the end of this and look at the things that worked really well and, and what areas that we think might, might require improvement and also what other opportunities are there in the future. Like, I mean, this is the thing about this project that it wasn't just about sort of community mobilization and, and working directly with communities. It was applying various technologies at different points. You know, we, we went from face-to-face -face teacher training to suddenly an online program, you know, working with uh, private institutions to get a greater reach and get a greater opportunity for, for teachers to upgrade their qualifications. And, you know, we looked at the distance education as COVID came in. So, this has not just been a sort of, as I said, a, a normal, straightforward sort of project. It, it's been very, very innovative. There's been a lot of different things going on. And I think that, as I said, once we get to sort of the end of the project, it will be a good opportunity to sort of say, okay, right here, what do you think really worked? And what do you think we should be investing our efforts going forward to get that next million? Great, great. So speaking of innovation, uh, Tarek, that meet, may, makes me ask you about alternative education. Um, so if you could please tell us what exactly the need of alternative education is and who are the students who could utilize this non-formal way of education? Well, if you look at the number of our school children in Pakistan, one thing is obvious that formal education system is falling short to cater their needs. That means uh, if their schools were enough, if the quality is good, if the pull factor is strong, then we should not have, or the governance is up to par. That means we do not need any other alternative. Mm -hmm. But if the country had a huge number of out of school children, it requires to look beyond just the formal education the way education has been provided. It is a provincial subject in Pakistan. We have uh, five, let's say, autonomous uh, regional governments, and then they have to uh, have their own ministries, their own departments. So it's a very structured uh, formal education system. And what has happened in past few years, uh, JICA, you know, the Japanese International Development Agency, uh, EAA, because they have started working with us in the non-formal education space. Uh, some of the provincial literacy departments, there has been now an, uh, you know, a rising interest in looking for other ways which could be faster, less uh, expensive, and so that we can somehow bring all these children or most of these children into education system. So based on that, it's very simple. These are community-based schools. There's a one teacher who is teaching to multiple grade students. And, uh, you know, the, the cost is very low. Then there has to have a unique curriculum which can take a child, let's say, within three years from one through fifth grade, rather spending five years where the child has to go each year from one class. And when we say out of school children, we should remember that there are two groups, you know, the five to nine and then 10 to 16. And in Pakistan, 75% roughly out of school children fall in the category of age 10 to 16. So these are the children, you cannot take them to a formal school and put them with the kids who are five years old. So, so you need to have an alternative system that can net those children who are not going to be catered or engaged by the formal education system. So this is the non-formal education system. Now, what we are trying to do is to working with the other partners and actually create a whole ecosystem for the non-formal education. I mean, I can go out and set up a one non-formal school, appoint a teacher, Teacher and have 30 some or 40 kids and educate them, but that is not enough. Why? Because you need to have a curriculum that is designed according to, you know, that the duration of this course, you also need to, to be 
approved, accredited by the government bodies. So our first year into this program has been more of a lobbying with the provincial government in collaboration with JICA, with the support of EAA, to go and convince them that you have to adopt it as authentic, as a recognized way of teaching. Because these children, when they graduate from the grade five, they need a certificate to continue their education, to enroll themselves in a middle school or go beyond or into a vocational program. So now the non-formal education curriculum has been approved by most of these provincial and federal bodies. The second thing is that who are the non-formal teachers? These are the teachers which we hire from the communities. Their quality, their capacity may not be equal to what the formal school teachers are. And if you look at the formal uh, education, there are numerous teachers academy, teachers training colleges run by the government, also by the nonprofit actors that they have established training modules which are provided to the teachers to become a quality teacher. But when you go to the non-formal space, there is absolutely no way and no opportunities available. So in the last year, in the year three, Again, with the support of EAA, we have, and other partners and other donors, we have been successful in establishing uh, Pakistan's first virtual teachers training portal designed for the non-formal education and non-formal teachers. And our knowledge partner has been Alama Iqbal Open University, which is the second uh, distance university in the world has about 1.8 million students, largest in Asia, right here in Islamabad. So we're working very closely with their uh, academia, working together, developing modules. We have an in-house team of education experts now who have worked in past with the radio program. Now they're working on the virtual teachers training program. So now if you look at this academy, we already, it's uh, up and running from February, uh, I think uh, this year, uh, we have close to a thousand uh, enrollments. And what will happen once this program is done, the academy is going to be there. And I think so another impact of our partnership with EAA is that we are working, co-creating certain interventions that will have a longer life than the project cycle. And this is another contribution to the ecosystem. The third thing is that you have to go out and find more community-based partners because these schools are easily manageable, easily affordable, so that this trend takes place and you are not only spending all your resources on a formal education system, which is ideal perhaps for the children below you know, five to nine, but not for the older kids. So, so these are the things. And of course, uh, lastly, we want to uh, do full advocacy before this program ends. We are holding regional and national seminars, talking to the government uh, policymakers and see how they can put more money into the non-formal education. So if you look at the total spending of Pakistan in education, uh, you know, uh, per capita is very, very low. It has to be at least two to three times more. Mm -hmm. so, so these are our efforts that we are doing. And I think when we started this program, to be honest, we weren't that smart about these things. This is the learning we had you know, along this journey. And these thoughts were refined working closely with our partners, with their feedback, with their guidance, also working very closely with the federal government the federal you know, Ministry of Education, the provincial uh, governments, their uh, you know, planning and development, their literacy department, their school education departments, their social welfare and their labor departments, because most of these departments are involved with, you know, with out of school children issue. So, so this is uh, what I meant or we meant with the establishing or strengthening non-formal education ecosystem in Pakistan. That's great. This is such an inspiring uh, conversation and I wish we had more time, but now is time to move on to the audience uh, questions. And I would actually invite um, any of you, Brett or Tariq, would you like to answer this question, which we just got? Um, so 
one of our audience is asking what role have the provincial district governments played in the success of this program? And what are some of the challenges of working with various provincial district governments? Um, Tariq, would you like to start with this question first, please? In, in the, uh, in the you know, uh, sorry. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it is important to understand that uh, Pakistan government has been one of the co-funders of this program. <laughs> we had the government partners, uh, which have supported us through in-cash and in-kind support, right? So, so I think one of the uh, privilege we had working with them was to leverage their resources. And that means from district level to provincial level to federal levels. So, so I think their role primarily has been a funding partner as well as the facilitators in implementing you know, uh, or implementation of this program. Mm. The challenges, however, are that the government has its own way of working, their own style, their own pace. And that doesn't mean that it is a bad, but it is different. You know, the, the way we look at the problem, our approach to the problem solving, the time involves, there's a huge difference. And how you actually manage to have that, you know, how do you maintain balance? How you can continue working with them where maybe EA expects from us to deliver something in six months, but government will be totally comfortable delivering it in two years. You know, so, so those are the things where we have to work very closely with our government partners go. And, and I can tell you, they have been a great help to us. Uh, so it's not like that we have been uh, blocked you know, or there have been obstacles. I mean, actually it's hard to believe, but let me tell you, a light has been granted permission to operate in all regions of Pakistan. Perhaps maybe the only unique international nonprofit organization in Pakistan today, which has full access to all parts of country. So I think why, it is happening because we are partners with the government. We are not operating in isolation. So, so you're we saying we are not even working for, for a light? It absolutely, but as I'm saying, the purpose was not that we bring government in so we get more access right. to you know, operate. I think it is a byproduct of that, that if you are working hand in hand with the government, you earn their trust. They see value in the partnership. They see you are there in the trenches with them, making a difference. Then obviously you build a repute and the repute as a payoff. And that payoff is that we did not, unlike some of the organization have a genuine issues in operating. Sometimes they are restricted for their geographical, uh, you know, you know, limits. Sometimes they're restricted because some of their staffs do not have visas. You know, so all of those challenges that international players have been facing, I think they should also learn that if you have to work in Pakistan, you cannot work in isolation. Yes, you can still bring results, but they may not be lasting. So to bring lasting results, you have to go, governments have huge budgets. They may not sometimes so efficient with their money or in terms of ROI, but they have resources. You have to forge partnerships. You have to combine your synergies, your resources to get a better impact. And that is what was uh, earlier highlighted by Brett. All these partnerships have been uh, a nice contribution towards our common goal. That's great. So Brett, uh, that makes me ask you this question, which uh, has been sent by one of our audience in Uganda. And they're asking that they are very curious to know what exactly are the best practices and initiatives Uganda can borrow or copy from Pakistan to be able to improve on their struggling education system. What advice do you have? So Brett, you have a wonderful partnership with uh, Pakistan and uh, the education community over there. Would you, would you like to shed some light on this question, please? 
Oh, it's a, it's a tricky one because uh, actually understanding the complexities of what's going on in Uganda, it's, it's hard to make that kind of association. But I, but I think what's important, um, my, my best advice is, is to really look at what the barriers are. What's children out of school in Uganda? You know, really getting an understanding of the ground of, of, of what's going on um, in communities and families. What are the individual circumstances? Um, seeing what the, the common trends are that are keeping kids out of school. Is it a transportation and distance issue? Is it a poverty issue? Um, is it a, a quality of education issue that you know parents don't want to send their kids to school because they don't see the cost benefit? You know, they, they, they take the child away from helping on, on the farm or with livestock and, you know, and then they don't get their kids educated because of the quality. So really getting an understanding of, of what those issues are and then really sort of working as, as a story thing. And I've sort of mentioned really sort of building that level of partnership, whether it is with communities, whether it is with local government, whether it is with other, with other ODAs or donors or other civil society actors and looking at how each can come together and make a contribution to address those barriers. So as, as we've mentioned earlier on a global sense for us, we, we, we did not reach this sort of towards this 10 million commitment without the, the 50 plus international partners that, that we have. You know, everyone's made a contribution. Everyone has a specialization. Everyone has a good understanding of what the issue is in their own countries or regions. And I think that that's really what needs to be also applied at the local level. And, you know, be, be that instigator of change, you know, be that leader, you know, take that risk, take that chance, you know, something that Tarek and his team have done in Pakistan so well is, you know, try and look at the unachievable and then get people to rally around it and move together and, 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 and achieve and not only achieve, but achieve it well, you know, like with good quality. It's not just about ticking a number of getting kids into school. It's also making sure that we keep them in school and they get a quality education at the end of that. You know, I think, you know, Tarek was mentioning about the, the partnerships with government. Um, but also like the big, really interesting thing for me really on this project too, was the level that was done at the school. I mean, the, the support was provided at the school level. You know, they, they worked with school management plans. They made them real. You know, I've, I've seen in different countries, poor schools go through this process of developing these school improvement plans or management plans. You know, they submit them up to their district offices and their, or their provincial offices. And then suddenly there's no money that comes down. They barely got enough money to pay the teacher or have some textbooks and some simple supplies. Now, and something that this project's done is we had matching grants. So we came in and working with, you know, Tarek's team working with, with local government saying, okay, here's a certain amount of money we're going to give to this school to support this plan that they've developed. See if you can match it. See if we can provide some additional resources there so that school can solve its own issues in regards to what's going on with access. And Tarek could give you a list or a variety of different initiatives that each school has implemented that has provided a safe, secure, child-friendly school to attract those kids in. So, as I said, you know, I think that the, what they can learn from, from Pakistan is the fact that, you know, each, each context is quite complex. You need to be innovative. You really need to back yourself. And, you know, even though you might have some doubters out there, uh, forget about that. Really have confidence in yourself and really bring those people together to achieve these big targets. Well, thank you so much, both of you gentlemen, Tarek and Brett. What a wonderful and inspiring conversation that was, really. And with this, we are running behind time a little bit, so I'm going to move it to Jeremy. Please uh, conclude it for us. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Nufat, Brett, and Tarek for such a great conversation today. If there was any questions uh, that we didn't make it to today, uh, we'll be sure to follow up with you and get you an answer. You know, enrolling so many kids in school and continuing this work throughout the pandemic has actually been incredible. And Brett, you mentioned instigators of change, and that is the best description of the alike team across Pakistan and the community mobilizers who are working directly with teachers, students, and parents. You know, none of this would be possible without any of them, and we can't thank you enough. And it's also amazing to think, despite all this incredible work, this is just the start. 
We've actually had several follow-up questions about how to join the enthusiasm of our, our anonymous donor to directly amplify the support to the communities and families. Uh, so we're gonna pop up a screen. Yep, there it is. It's a flow code. And all you have to do is open up your camera on your phone, focus it on the uh, flow code that you see. The box should actually then pop up and you just click it and it will take you to the website that actually will give uh, more information about the program and if you wanna help support the incredible work of our teams and uh, match the enthusiasm of that incredible donor. Um, every gift makes a difference, any amount, it goes directly to uh, support the, the kids, getting kids back into school. So thank you. Um, as Nukbot mentioned, we met little, went a little bit over time today, very much. Uh, Thank you all for staying with us and to learn more about it. Our workshare series continues next week, uh, where we're going to take a deep dive into the Nakabali Community Library um, Network. So if everyone wants to come back off mute for a final time, pop your video back on if you would like, and help me thank and say goodbye to Tadak, Brett, and Nukba. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thank you. Have a good week. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Nukbat. You were amazing. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. -bye. <clears throat>